Welcome or welcome back everybody. Thanks so much for joining me today. We're gonna to do a black studio portrait and we're gonna make sure that the black background is completely black in camera, not afterwards. Okay, so I have notes today because I usually don't and nobody can understand anything. So essentially the aim of doing a black studio portrait is to have the background completely black. That is the aim. The aim is not to light the dog, the aim is to not light the background. So for everything that we're gonna to cover today, that's the principle that we're operating on that we want completely black background. And then after that, we want light on the dog. Let's cover equipment first. I'm not gonna go into the brands and makes of everything because to be honest with you, it doesn't matter. I've specifically got some very inexpensive modifiers with me today so that they are relatively easy to pick up for everybody who's doing them. We are in a shed which we've been in before. I will link that video above so that you can go ahead and watch that too. But we're back in the shed and this time we're doing black. So first of all, you're going to need a camera. It doesn't matter what camera you've got. A DSLR is brilliant. Mirrorless is fine. A SLT is also fine. The one thing you don't want to have is something that you can't use on full manual mode. So you need to be able to use it on fully manual mode. Then the next thing that you need is some lights. I've got with me two strobes and a speed light today. There is no reason why you can't do all of this with speed lights and you can also just have one light, which we will cover as well today too. The one thing that you don't want to have is continuous light. If you use continuous light or ambient light, you're not going to be able to get this result as easily because you're not gonna be able to overpower any other ambient light in the scene. Some people do shoot black background portraits through barn doors and uh, shed doors, things that have got a light outside and then very dark inside. You can do that, but technically that's not lit as a studio portrait. So we're not gonna be doing that today. Uh, lens. So lenses, I've got with me today the 24 to 72.8 zoom lens. I prefer using a 24 to 70 for studio portraits, but you can pretty much get away with any lens. The wider the lens you're gonna use, the bigger the backdrop you're gonna need because just of the field of view that's covered, but you will be absolutely fine using a kit lens for this as well. So you don't have to have a very expensive lens to do this kind of a shot because you don't need to shoot wide open. You don't need to shoot at a low F number. If you don't know what I mean by F numbers, aperture, ISO or shutter speed, you are absolutely definitely gonna wanna go ahead and watch the exposure triangle video, which we have already done and that is on the channel. I will link that above too. You're gonna need to understand that to be able to do this well. So if you don't understand that at the moment, you need to go ahead and watch that and then come back. I mean, do I really need to mention? Do I need to mention that you need spare batteries? You need spare batteries at all times. So I've got spare double A's with me and then I've also got a spare camera battery with me. I've also got spare memory cards. So you don't wanna run out of these things. Then the next thing is a backdrop. You don't actually need a backdrop. We're using it just to make editing easier because what we don't want to do is have to deal with the reflection very active birds. We don't want to have a reflection of the lights coming off of anything and that's why having a backdrop is useful. I personally prefer to use fabric for black studio because it absorbs light better. If you use black paper, which we also have got with us today, it will reflect some of the light back off more than fabric would. You can also use vinyl or you can use a painted wall. Any of these things will work, but fabric will help you out more than it will hinder you if that makes sense. So with your light stands and your backdrop stands, the more stable your backdrop stands and your light stands are, the better and easier this is gonna be for you. Always think health and safety first. I have not weighted my stands today and I've got my light stands, as in light, not heavy duty stands on the lights at the moment. This is not normal for me. I would usually have the stands that are holding up the backdrop on the lights because they are far more heavy duty. Heavier is better. There is a link to those in the description below. So if you don't have solid light stands, go ahead and get some. And also consider weighting your stands, especially if you're doing this with clients. Modifiers. Could you please pass me the beauty dish? You don't have to be so gentle with it. Ta. I've just gained some stuff next to me now. Let's just have a tea. 
I do like talking about modifiers, but it's a bit of a rabbit hole. So we need to just look at what modifiers are. Modifiers essentially change light or they change how the light comes out and therefore they change the look and feel of the image afterwards. We are going to use a specific set of modifiers today. You guys will have seen my other modifiers, my normal ones, which I use, which are, I think, uh, one meter 20 or 90 centimeter octoboxes. Those are my normal modifiers. However, when we're shooting black, we need to have control. And that's really important because shooting well on a black background and making sure it's black straight out of camera all comes down to control. And if you don't have control of your light, it's not gonna go very well for you. So the modifiers that we choose need to be able to control the light. And some modifiers control light more than others. So we've got with us today some strip boxes, which are to either side. Now a strip box itself is already a controlled light source because you are directing the light in a very specific fashion out of the front. Essentially it's a narrow soft box and so a strip box without a modifier on looks like this one here and then we also have got grids which channel the light far more directionally out of the soft box or the strip box. So that has got a grid on it and what that does is, can you just chuck me my grid? Ta. So a grid looks like this. So essentially it is quite literally just grid of fabric and each piece is maybe an inch an inch deep, I would say, and you stick your grid over the front of your soft box. And what that does is that gives you a very specific directional light source. It does mean that you need to have control over your subject as well, because if they move away from the spot where the light is, they're not going to get hit by light. But it also means that you've won in the control department for not letting that light go onto the backdrop. So that is a win. The other directional light sources that you can use are beauty dishes. A beauty dish is semi-directional as a standard piece because the light is funneled out in a straight direction. However, most beauty dishes you can also get with a honeycomb grid like so. So you put the honeycomb grid over the front of the beauty dish and you've essentially just created a grid like those soft boxes over there. Like so, your other options when it comes to directional light sources are uh, snoots. So you can use a snoot, it's a very harsh form of light. A snoot essentially is if you think of a cone backwards on the top of a light, so it's going to a smaller uh, end point. Very difficult to use well with dogs because dogs move more than humans would. So you could just stick a human in the right place with a snoot. You can also use barn doors. Barn doors are fine, again, very harsh light, but fine to go behind to offer some separation in the use of a rim light. That's kind of it for modifiers. What you would not use is a modifier that has no control over the spill of the light, and one of those would be an umbrella. So you wouldn't use a shoot through umbrella for a black background shot if you're going to do it well and not do a lot of editing afterwards. Hello, little birdie. Bye. Okie dokie. Um, probably important to note when you're shooting on a black background that if you're working with dogs, it's actually a lot easier if you lift the dog up off of the floor. It's going to depend on the type of dog and the subject that you're working with as to whether that's going to be safe to do so or not. But if you're wanting to get full body portraits of dogs, lifting them up onto something else is going to help you out a lot. It just allows you to have a little bit more control over the light that's hitting the floor because the floor is technically part of the set and you will also be able to make sure that your dog or subject, whatever it might be, stays in one place and doesn't move around outside of their spot. When you're shooting on a black background, the spot that the subject is in is, is probably the most important thing out of everything. So the more that they move away from their spot, the more difficult you're gonna find getting the right shot. I think that made some form of sense. And then the space. So the last thing that's really important in terms of equipment is the space that you've got available. We have specifically come here to the shed to shoot this because we've got enough space. As you guys know already, my little living room is not big enough to do a black portrait well. You can do it, but it's just not technically brilliant. So we've come here to do it in a much larger space. There is a massive expanse of indoor shed space here, but we're only using one corner because you don't need that much space but you do want to have separation from the background area. So the space behind me to the background is probably seven, six meters, maybe five meters, about maybe five meters, maybe give or take. Um, you don't need bigger than that really, to be honest. Um, and realistically you want to have your subject probably sat about a meter 
or two behind where I am sat. The main thing is that they are far enough away from the background so that you've got light fall off. Let's discuss light really quickly. The most important things for you guys to know about light, especially when it comes to studio light, is the larger the light source is relative to the subject, the softer the light will be. So the larger the light source relative to the subject, the softer the light will be. So today we're using the two strip boxes to light the front of the subject. Now, theoretically, in comparison to the subject, they're quite similar in size, but the closer those are to the subject, the softer the light will be. The other thing to note about light is that the closer the source is to the subject, the faster the light will fall off. That's important for when you're shooting black portraits. So the closer the light is to the subject, the faster the light will change from being bright to dark when it hits the subject. So if you have those light sources very close to the subject, the background will be a lot darker. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so we're gonna look at settings and setup now. So, I best get up, really. So the most important thing to note about settings is that you will set up like you do any other studio session. And for uh, most of those things, you will need to be using your camera's sync speed for the flash. Every camera has a different sync speed. Most of them are very similar, but it is something to look in the manual for or on Google because it's very important. My sync speed for the Sony's, as far as I know, because these are not Sony approved flashes, the sync speed is 160th of a second. So you can't shoot higher than 160th of a second. We are not gonna be using high speed sync today, nor are we going to be using TTL because control, control is the aim of the game. So manual, 160th of a second or your camera's sync speed. Your ISO doesn't need to be set any higher than 100. There is no reason to have your ISO higher than 100. You could go to 200 if you needed to, but realistically, there is no reason why your, your ISO should be higher than that. So therefore, you've got two of your exposure triangle locked down, which gives you one left. Dan, what's the one that's left? So what's A stand for? Yeah, see? Come on, Dan. So aperture is the last thing left. Now aperture is what's gonna be controlling the level of light in the scene. And as we set up for all studio sessions, the most important thing is to have absolutely no ambient light hitting the backdrop. So to be able to ascertain whether you've got any ambient light hitting the backdrop, so you just turn your flash trigger off, like so. So that's off now. So if I take a picture, it's not going to be controlling anything at all. And what you want to be doing is getting a completely black background. To check that you've got a completely black background, the easiest way of doing that is to actually set up black clipping in the live view display of your camera. So most digital cameras will have a black clipping selection option in the display preferences. So what we also wanna make sure that we are on is single point focus. So when we are on single point focus, essentially, again, I use back button focus too, but our focus point, which is actually up here somewhere, is the only thing that will be focused. You see it light up in green? So that is the focus point. So we wanna be in control of moving that around and have the camera just pick up on that. I use back button focus, which means that I can focus, let go, recompose, and then shoot. So what we want to be able to set up, I'm on 120, but fifth of a second because 160th of a second is a bit risky. We'll go 160th for now. ISO 100 and I'm at F9 as a starting point. So if I take a picture of this scene and then go into play, that's got black clicking, clipping enabled. So can you see the flashing that was on that there? So anything that is flashing white is completely clipped. So that's the picture, that is a picture. And anything that is flashing is black. So we've got a little bit that is still peeking through. So what we can do to make sure it's completely black is just change the aperture. So remember, we're leaving our shutter speed, we're leaving our ISO, we're just gonna increase the aperture. So we're just gonna push the aperture up one to F10. And when we play that picture, we've only got just the corners. As long as the most part is completely black, the main in internal sections of the picture. You could keep going and just push it to F10 F11, sorry, and then the more you increase your aperture, the F number, the more of the image will be completely black. So you wanna keep going until you've got a completely black image. And then at that point, unless the light changes, the ambient light changes, you do not touch your settings at all on your camera ever again. That's it. And the only other controls that you have in terms of how much light is in the shot come from 
your artificial light. And then that way, you know that your ambient light is completely taken care of and anything that is lighting the scene or the background is coming from your artificial light. So when you're setting up where stuff's gonna go, you wanna be looking at where the sides of your modifiers are pointing. When we're looking at the soft box here, the strip box, we're looking at where is that pointing? So what is the widest point of where this light will spill? And if you were to walk in a straight line, you would end up over here. So we know, because that's got a grid on it as well, very little of that light is gonna go this way onto the backdrop. The same thing with the other light. So you're looking at where the side of it is pointing. So we're just starting with a two light setup. We'll try and introduce a bit of a rim light, but I'm not too fussed about the backlight if I'm being honest. Because this one doesn't have a grid on, you need to just be aware that some of your light will probably spill sideways. And also some of it might be reflecting off of this wall to the side. But even then we're still well out of the way of hitting our backdrop. Then if you want to add a third light, we've just got a speed light up here with a little softbox on. You can introduce your third light to the corner. This one is on a slave cell, so it means that it will only flash if these two flash, and we need to control the power of this manually at the light, rather than controlling it via the trigger on the camera. So the speed light will just be sat at the back to add a pop of light, and what that does is it'll add separation from the subject to the background if we want it. Sometimes you might not be able to see it too much, that's fine, and one thing to note is this obviously doesn't have a grid on it, it's quite old, and there is a gap coming out of the back of the softbox here because it's a quick fold up pop up one. You might end up with some spill hitting the backdrop. But the first thing that we're gonna do is add the main light. And the main light for me is gonna be this light here. So this light to this side, I'm gonna turn this off and I'm gonna turn this off. In fact, no, let's use this as our main light. Okay, this is gonna be our main light, so we're gonna leave that on. I turn this off. So now if we turn our trigger on, this light should be the only light that flashes. And this has got a pretty heavy grid on it, which we're gonna leave on for now. So we wanna kind of find the cross point of both of these two lights, which is about here. So I know that I want my subjects, probably front paws in the terms of a dog, to be on or around this line on the floor and pretty much central to it as well. We might change that but the subject needs to be about here. Now, it does mean that when we look through the camera that some of the background might not be in it, but because we've exposed perfectly for ambient light, we don't really need a background anyway. So the next thing to do is just to add a subject in. If you've got a stuffed animal, they are brilliant to bring in at this stage because you will not bore a stuffed animal, but you will bore a dog. I've brought Alfie with me because he doesn't mind being stood and bored. So I will put him in this scene, stood on this little mark that we have found here, and I will begin to build the light with this light first. Okay, I've just hurt my knee, but we'll be fine. So what we've got, we've turned on our trigger on the light. We're not touching the camera settings at all. We're on fully manual. We're on autofocus on single point or flexible spot. That's what we're using for here. And we're gonna move that to fit and sit on his face. If you are using EVF, now is a brilliant time to turn off your settings on feature because otherwise you're not going to be able to see anything at all through the viewfinder. So you wanna really just be looking at the ambient light scene. Put him at his point, which is here, which is here. Come go, come close. So we're gonna put our teddy bear or Alfie in the shot, line ourselves up with where we wanna be. He's got a hair on his nose, but never mind. You wanna get into a position, focus and shoot. And when you look at the back of the camera, good you will be able to see your clipping. So I've got a slight bit of highlight clipping on this side of the dog, but I've still got everything at his side. Can you see that okay? Everything at his side is completely flashing, which is great. This is good news for us. So that is what we want to see. We've got a little bit of light spilling over onto this side of the background. So what we will just try and do is angle it slightly towards us, which you can do as simply <laughs> as that and you put your subject back back and sit good so he's in the same place as he was if this was a stuffed bear it would not move at all 
and you just take another shot and make sure that your background is completely lost to shadow. Waiting. So I'm just checking again, much better. All of that side of him and the backdrop is now clipped, if you can see. So I'm gonna reward him and then we're gonna add a light, which is this one. Good lad. So we've added a light. This one does not have a grid on it. So we're gonna to have to really watch the level of light that is coming to this side of the background. But we're gonna put our subject where we think we need them. This way. He's like, I give you all of the tricks. <laughs> Take another test shot, we've added a light. So we now have got two lights on. What we can see, good boy waiting, from the test shot is that this light is quite significantly darker than this one. I wanna just drop this left light slightly and increase this right one slightly. So that's one eighth plus 0.7 and that's one eighth power. So his front feet are on that line and I'm lining up the shot again. Same position, nothing has changed apart from the power of the light, waiting. So we will just look at the clipping. We still got completely black at this side. So the one without the grid on has done a good job. We've got black at this side and a little bit of black in the ear, but we'll be able to lift that up in post-production afterwards. So I'm quite happy with the level of light on that. So if we zoom in, we know we have got a catch light in this eye to this side, and then we have got a catch light in this light eye to this side. So what we might go ahead and do is just increase the power of this one a little bit, but we'll wait till we've got the black dog on there. What we're gonna do just before we get the other dog in is we're gonna switch on the light to the back to see if we can get a little bit of separation from the background. So it's just angled to hit the back of his head. We might need to raise it slightly. Again, we're focusing on where the dog is on their spot. You can see a tiny little bit, but I'm just gonna turn the power up on this. And what I want is a nice rim. Good, so we've got beautiful rim light, good. Okay, if we put it on clipping, we've lost the clipping from around him because of that soft box being on full power. But actually, if you look, we've got full separation of his hair from the background. So it's gonna mean that we can just turn the exposure down a little bit on the whole image and we can cut off the background that's coming in there. What we'll do is we'll just turn that down slightly, move it a little bit closer, and then we will get our subject in. I'm just gonna take a quick picture of the white balance card because I forgot again. I put them gently. And all we want is the white balance card to be lit. And then that gives us the white balance of everything. Let's bring Bram in and see what the situation is because she's a lot darker, she doesn't have the white. So we might be all right, we also might not be. Let's bring the doggo. Oh, Bram. <laughs> this is Bramble. So with Bram, she's never been in a studio environment before. So what we can do is we can just test her. Good girl, Bram. So with her, because she's not used to having the light, she's fine to, if you release her when the lights have flashed, that's fine. Could I have the ball? Is it stay? Stay. So I'm just focusing on the eye. Okay. So the light is fine. I'm not concerned by the amount of light hitting the subject. Potentially a little bit low, but I think we will be fine. So we keep it quite short for Bram because this is a new experience for her and she's not done this before. So if we're looking at our picture, we can check the focus and make sure that we are super sharp on the eyes, which we are. Maybe slightly low. I remember that we don't want to touch our aperture or our switch speed or our ISO. So if we're low, we need to increase the power of the light. So I'm going to increase the power of the left light and we'll just reshoot. See so if we pop Bram Bram back in. Just having a rest. <coughs> <coughs> Oh, my bad. Good catch. <laughs> it's a good one, that. Right, let's do one light because the owner wanted a one light shot. So for a one light shot, we want to have quite directional light. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this one here. We're going to put a grid on the other one. Bear with me for a sec. Hi. Oh, you oh. <laughs> oh. So that grid is now on. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna bin off the light to the rear. And instead, this is gonna be our light to the rear. 
we're kind of mirroring the two lights a little bit. So it's not flashing at the camera, but it's not far off. And we've got this one about there. So that will give us separation from the background from this side. And this one will light the side of the subject. So for this shot, what we need is we need Bram about here ish, um, looking that way. So she needs to be looking at you. So for this one, if you stand here with maybe some cheese or something, and she wants to be sort of looking kind of straight at this light. Yeah. Gay girl. Yeah. So we put Bram back. So one thing to just remember is that obviously Bramble wasn't on a lead today, which meant that it was actually quite difficult to keep her in her spot. You saw how she had to be in this particular area for this shot to work. So if you're in a situation where you, you know, the dog's not staying where they need to stay, just put them on a lead and ask the owner to hold them. So in this situation, you just gotta make sure that the owner or handler is not blocking the light. So your owner wouldn't stand here. You'd be surprised how often that happens. And your owner would also not stand here. Again, you'd be surprised. So what they would need to do is find a gap in the light and then stand with the lead high above. Legs out the way, lead high above, but not pulling the dog up by the neck. Nice thin lead, ideally black, and just hold it out of the way. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna pat down, I'm not gonna film that, and I'll meet you back in the office to edit one of these pictures. Bram's like, yes, this is working. I thought you said he wasn't gonna set, start a forklift anytime soon. No, that was his truck. Oh. Okay, is it, is it gone now? Is that it? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> We've got direct sunlight coming in, but it's not on our background area, so we're okay. 